Thank you, Dr. Edmonds. Our next speaker is Dr. David Scruton, Professor of Anthropology at Ball State University. Dr. Scruton has a PhD from the University of Washington. He has had his undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma and is a native Oklahoman. His interests are in the out of doors, hiking, backpacking. His topic, the natural history of leisure. Dr. David Scruton. Thank you, Mr. Russell, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is, is this about the right distance? Is it audible? Or as audible as anybody wishes it to be? Well, uh, I listened with intense interest to my distinguished colleague from the history department when, that is to say, I was able to tear that interest away from the Juno-esque figure behind which I now take refuge. <laughs> And I was a trifle surprised when he did not urge us to win one for the Gipper. <laughs> or remind us that when the going gets tough, the tough have sense enough to get out of the game, I dare say. <laughs> Some time ago, Mr. Rosenman telephoned me and asked me if I would participate in this program. I thought the most reasonable interpretation of that was that he had a bizarre sense of humor, but he persisted in the invitation, and I was finally obliged to take him seriously. And as so often happens, when someone is kind enough to imagine that one has something to say, one is deluded into believing that this is probably true. <laughs> Besides, with any kind of luck, before the sticking point came, the world would come to an end, and there would be no necessity to reveal the hideous truth, which is, so far as I know, that there is no anthropological perspective, as such, on leisure. <laughs> it is true that my modest experience with anthropological conventions could lead one to conclude that there is, if one accepts as a synonym for leisure, debauchery, but I do not presume that that is part of the intent of this program. The historian is very fortunate. There are very many of them, and they tend to be rather a talky lot. <laughs> It is always possible to find an historical perspective on almost anything. <laughs> Proof of the latter proposition is contained in the program, which allots to Professor Edmonds 20 minutes, whilst giving to me but a scant 10. <laughs> I have a suspicion I may be able to pass on some of mine to he, him who follows me. But in any event, I was obliged to contrive an anthropological perspective on leisure. Now, this was an excellent exercise because it obliges one to do what, so far as I know, has not been done in a systematic way. It compels one to reflect upon matters, and that is uh, an excellent exercise indeed. The consequences may seem very much like the elephant laboring to bring forth the gnat, but uh, I do have a couple of propositions that I would like to put to you, not that they are particularly revelatory, nor even necessarily true, I'm not certain, but that they may provide some food upon which to reflect, if you are so minded. To propose that leisure is, and has been, and will continue to be an important part of human experience is, as I say, not particularly extraordinary, an absolutely unexceptionable comment, you will say. But it is true, I think, for reasons having to do other than with the pleasure content of leisure, which is so obvious. The importance of leisure, I believe, and this accounts for the title of my remarks, can be related to mankind's peculiar evolutionary history. 
It is an almost automatic response of most anthropologists, kind of a, a knee-jerk reflex, you might say, to suspect that any human trait that is universally distributed among the societies of mankind, so far as we know, any such trait is likely to be rooted in some kind of universal human experience. And of these universal human experiences, without doubt, the most pervasive is our common subjection to the process of natural selection, or more commonly put, evolution. I do not mean for a moment, as it might be supposed that I do, that there has been some specific evolution of a, of a particular human reflex, a kind of instinct for leisure or recreation. By no means, I do not mean that at all. Our evolution is not responsible for leisure, but for our capacity for it. It is, after all, something that we create. And above all, our evolution is responsible for the uses to which we can and have put it. I should like to make clear that by leisure I do not mean play or recreation. These are not synonyms by any means. Playing is what you can do with leisure. Leisure, I should be inclined to define in the absence of any authority to the contrary, as the time which is available to a person which is not required for the pursuit of life-supporting activities. Play, on the other hand, as I comprehend it, refers to the various forms of satisfaction-bringing activity which are performed for the sake of the satisfaction itself and not because they contribute to the support of life. Leisure time, therefore, this free time, time free from eating or hunting or sleeping or whatever it may be, may be devoted to play or to recreation, but it certainly need not be. Leisure, I think, above all, is the time to do with as one wishes. It may be used in play and recreation. It may be used to pursue solitary rambles or to take a nap or to scratch oneself, or to listen to music, or to travel, or to write poetry, or to plot the assassination of the Pope, or anything which happens to seize one. At this moment, and for the purposes of these remarks, I am not concerned particularly, or even at all, about the purposes to which leisure is put, but rather how we came historically to be possessed of leisure time, which can be devoted to anything that our imagination and our inclinations can suggest to us. There are, I suggest, certain preconditions to the existence of leisure, and to understand these and how they came to be may be the first step in the creation of a natural history of leisure. The essential precondition, by definition, is free time, and that, of course, is dependent upon the means to come by it. Free time is not presented to one. It is not an accomplished fact by virtue of one's being human. It must be acquired. And we came to it, we came by this leisure time, through the evolution of our capacity to develop a technology and a body of knowledge and understanding which allow a return on labor which is sufficient to enable us to avoid spending all our waking hours supporting life. In mankind, apart from other animals, but in the human species, this is accomplished solely through the phenomenon of culture. The habits, the customs, the ideas, the understandings, which we come by only as members of a particular society, a particular social system. We have undergone the evolution of the capacity to create culture and the evolution of our total and absolute dependence upon it. In short, the evolution of our hands, the grasping mechanism by which we manipulate, literally, the world, 
the evolution of the central nervous system, particularly, of course, the evolution of the human brain, the evolution of the human eye, which is a generalized primate eye, it is true, but nevertheless an excellent one for all that, being able to see in color and perceive depth and resolve sharp images at all distances so that one can see the fly ball falling down into center field. And supremely, the evolution of our capacity for language, articulate speech, symbolic interaction. These have provided the potential for free time, not the reality, only the potential. The evolution of these attributes certainly did not create the uses to which leisure is put. They are, so to speak, only the enabling legislation. Without them, leisure, as we understand it, would not have been available to us. Pray bear in mind that leisure is not a uniquely human thing. The only thing about it which is unique from our point of view are the purposes to which we put it and our attitudes toward it. Lions have leisure, as in fact do many predatory animals. A well-fed male lion in fighting trim will spend, if given the opportunity, upwards of 22 hours a day in sleep, arousing himself only for the remaining two to see where the female lion has killed and having eaten once more to bed at the end of an exhausting day, I have no doubt. Uh, baboons have a certain amount of leisure time which they spend grooming one another. Many animals, particularly while young, commonly play. But it is a characteristic of these creatures, for the most part, that in maturity they cease to do so. There is an implication here we should not overlook. Humans do not cease to play. They simply institutionalize and commercialize their playing until as often as not they no longer find much pleasure in it. But that's something that someone else will have to work out. Humans are peculiar in that they perpetuate infantile habits into adulthood. No, I mean precisely what I say. We do not remain uh, children. We simply continue to act like children. Not only do we perpetuate these infantile habits into adulthood, we expand them and make them the basis of philosophical systems, not to mention enormous commercial enterprises, which is fine. This habit and this capacity of ours are related to and dependent upon, above all else, language, which is the second time I have alluded to that. It is through language, ladies and gentlemen, and through language alone, that we are able to create such concepts. The very ideas themselves, not the reality, but the ideas of leisure and play and fun and recreation. In human experience, leisure is a function of the mind, which operates through our facility for speech. And speech like all other characteristics of the human animal, is a consequence of the process of evolution. Well, I concede this is only the smallest beginning. It leaves altogether untouched a subject to which I think we might well devote a good deal of attention, not only for its own sake, but for the possibility of its relationship to leisure, and that is the matter of creativity and its relationship to leisure, as I say, yes. In passing, I should like to observe that necessity is not the mother of invention, nor has ever been. Leisure is the mother of invention. In short, in ways which I think we may scarcely perceive, or at least I, at any rate, scarcely perceive or imagine, leisure, leisure is a consequence and an expression of our evolution our natural history, and therefore is an aspect of human nature, and I have no doubt that it is one which has not only played an important role in human life, but will continue to do so. Thank you.